Good morning. My name is Ken Webster from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, and thank you for the very warm introduction. I'm afraid I don't speak German. I only have two languages, good and bad English. <laughs> uh, you will be able to decide which of those I am using today. Uh, I'm going to look at this, um, this question from a slightly different angle. And before I do that, I should just say what the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is set up to do, and it's to accelerate the transition towards a circular economy, one in which, uh, the, which is restorative and regenerative of natural and social capital, and one which is keeping products, components, and materials in their highest value at all times. But the key word in the circular economy, or resource efficiency might be the appropriate translation, uh, is the word economy. It's not just about business. It's about how the economy works. And I think there have been several shocks, shall we call it, in recent months around the economy and uh, who's in which group and uh, who's running what. I, I'm a little bit ashamed sometimes to be English with what's gone on. Uh, but I, I almost feel assured that the way our bureaucracy works, nothing will happen very quickly. Uh, all right, so <laughs> let's um, proceed. Just see if this works. There we are. I always like to start with a quote from Einstein because it makes me look a little cleverer. But this is quite important. I'll read it. Uh, just it's about the only thing I will read. To raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle requires creative imagination and marks real advance in science. Now, the rest of that picture there contains three tools that we use. The microscope and telescope we're well, fam very familiar with, but the macroscope, the idea of dropping the detail to see the big picture, is not a habit that we have really so much at the moment. But I'm going to attempt a little bit of macroscope work as we go through. This is the tradition that we have grown up in through the Enlightenment of thinking that the world is like something like a machine. Our processes are mechanical. We can understand, predict, and control the world. And this was very advantageous. The, the world around us now is largely built with this sort of thinking based on direct causation, cause and effect, do the calculations, get the result. But this was because it was very hard to deal with uh, turbulent or chaotic processes. And this is where the beginnings of the insights of the digital age come in for me. We'll explain a little bit later. So an economy that suits the idea of a mechanical machine type world is very much the sort of linear economy we've heard discussed, which is take, make, and dispose. It takes a lot of energy, it produces a lot of waste, produces nice things as well, but it seems to be in some trouble. And uh, for a whole number of reasons, the economy doesn't seem to be working terribly well at the moment. Large swathes of people, large groups of people in different countries feel they are not getting much advantage out of it. Wages are stagnant or falling in many developed nations, uh, and uh, we will discuss work a little bit later. But the economy has to work, and if the, the post-war consensus about rising productivity, rising wages, and rising employment has been disrupted, the question isn't just one of resources. It's one about how we think about the economy and how we might change that to bring uh, new forms of prosperity into being. So that's the mental model we've had up to now. We are using an enlightenment, linear uh, um, economy, a mechanistic economy. But this is the designer Buckminster Fuller. He had quite a different view about how we deal with a problem. He says that you need to make the old model obsolete. There's no point in trying to mess around and tweak what we've got if there might be a way of doing it which makes the old model obsolete. Because people love the idea of this is real progress. We can do it differently. And from what we've already heard this morning, there's lots of opportunities to do things very, very differently. So here's the clue into digital. This is the Lorentz attractor, one of the first attempts at 
seeing what happens when you had computing to model a little system, well, it's a meteorological system, not so small, but very small variations revealed very different results. Even just um, reducing the point, the the um, the decimal point, or where you put, you cut off the excess of uh, the data, could generate very different results. And this is one of the first things I think about digital. I think we've forgotten. We couldn't really see non-linear, you know, feedback-rich systems. We couldn't model them before digital came along after World War II. But the thing is, these systems are very, very interesting, as we will see. Uh, we couldn't model that, the vortex from a plane, but nowadays it's quite possible to get a pretty good reproduction of that picture mathematically uh, by being able to process feedback-rich or not non-linear equations. These are systems which are not... Um, linear, as, uh, as the name would suggest, they have elements of complexity in them. Now, here's a diagram which shows the range of systems we have in our conceptual universe. We tended to create the Industrial Revolution with the mechanistic one. Things were assumed to be deterministic. And if they weren't deterministic, we could use statistics to deal with it. But the digital revolution revealed to us something that we probably knew intuitively that most real-world systems are ordered complexity. They are neither predictable nor chaotic. They're somewhere in between. Now, if this is where most real-world systems are, shouldn't we be designing our economy, our industry, our social systems in full cognizance and full understanding of this and stop pretending, as some forms of e economics do, that the economy will always end up in long-term equilibrium. Some people see the economy like a rocking horse. You can knock it around, but it will always sort itself out. Now, people who understand complexity understand the economy is more like a herd of wild horses. You know, if you're going to handle it, you've got to do that with some sensitivity because you can get a result you didn't want. So that's just one example of a different perspective. I do not see the economy as a rocking horse. I do not see long-term equilibrium as inevitable. It's much more sensitive than that. And this is why feedback-rich systems are probably coming much more to attention now that digitalization has really improved the way that we can understand them. Uh, just a couple of characteristics of feedback-rich systems you will all know. This is the carbon cycle. Very small variations in this cycle can, through time, through iteration, through feedback, bring big results. We know that. And it also emphasizes that in these sorts of systems, there are stocks and flows which are intimately related. And they also, these systems also work at different scales. They're interconnected. So you might be efficient in delivering air down the main bronchial pipes, bronchial tubes, but the job is done at the periphery, where it's a question of being effective in the transfer of uh, gases to and from the bloodstream. So we need to think more of effective systems. Because the question comes up, if you're very, very productive and you produce lots and lots of stuff, you really have to assume that somehow the other part of the equation fits. How does this stuff come back? Does it? Uh, who's going to buy it? It's all right lowering cost, but at some point you still have to have a customer. So it's just it's fairly commonsensical. But the eff effect could be this. If we really get to understand and um, these feedback-rich systems, instead of being on the surface on the little island we, and thinking nothing is there, we discover in the underwater realm, if you like, with another perspective, that it's a very rich world indeed. Now here's the diagram for which the Owen MacArthur Foundation is most readily identified. And this is a feedback rich diagram. Here's the old economy going down the middle, top to bottom. That's a linear economy ending in waste and, and limited feedback. But some people have argued that these two flows on the left hand side, it's a more biological cycle. And on the right-hand side, it's the technical materials pathway. 
those lines, those feedback lines, are what digital has done or what the opportunities digital brings to a production system because it's more feedback. As we were hearing, people know where materials are. We know what state condition uh, machines are in. We know who's using things. We know how they're using things. We can identify materials much better. We can stamp them. So we can get much more feedback about our production process and, and in the process create new business opportunities at the same time as being very resource efficient. I just want to point out a couple of other things. Top left, but this, I'm not going to even imagine this has a pointer thing. I'll probably ruin it. Uh, top left, you could see the regeneration of natural capital. This is the bio cycle. We have regenerative agriculture. We have opportunities to rebuild soils, store carbon there, if you like. That's what it can do. And on the bottom right, on the other side, this is where people like McKinsey tell us the new value is for business. It's not in the recycling loop, which is way out on the periphery, where all the embedded quality and energy is pretty much lost. It's a great business, particularly here in Germany. But the new business opportunities are in maintaining products, providing products as services, providing access to assets, as we have heard. This is where the, the profitability lies. And that has got quite profound implications in a way, because through digital, we can now imagine business systems, and they are already beginning to show up, where you want to maintain a product. Because when we started off in the Industrial Revolution, the idea was make, it, make more of it, make it cheaply, sell it, and you don't want to see it again. Because you want to sell it again, you want to sell more, you want to sell the latest version, and you want to introduce perhaps planned obsolescence to make sure they can't keep using the old one. And this was a function of scale. Scale and selling was a very good plan. But in, a, in an economy, as we've heard, which is much likely to be much more resource constrained, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. So anything that allows us to, to enable people to get the use of something without having to own it, because you can retain those materials, you can retain those components, you can retain, maintain the capital, gives you enormous resource savings because you don't give away the material. You don't give away the machine. It's yours. And because you've now got ways of monitoring its activity, it's, it's almost a gift in terms of additional revenue, perhaps. It's not they're not fully developed, but they're on the go. And this is, in a way, why digital will help defeat or overcome the, the, the imperative of scale and selling. You only have to look at additive manufacture as well, that we can now produce on different scales. We can produce things more regionally or locally. You transfer the plan and you let the, the local manufacturer do it for you. So it's all very exciting and, and it, uh, big opportunities uh, for revenue generation, I think, in that side. But <laughs> these things don't come without some penalties, potentially. This is from a Barclays Bank report about the headline for it was by, I think it was 2035, a 40% drop in sales of new vehicles because we've just found better ways of getting around town. With these, They see these sort of four types of vehicles ruling the road at those stage, everything from uh, pooled shared autonom autonomous vehicles through to uh, traditional automobiles. But it's moving, as the previous speaker said, much quicker than we ever imagined. I remember looking at this area in 2013 and it was, yeah, yeah, we'll get autonomous cars one day. Yeah, sure. Now they're, they're on the streets in places like Singapore and experiments and in Philadelphia, I think. So you've got major consequences for that in terms of materials. Are you in the right business? If it's moving towards data, if it's moving from products to services to platforms that connect people up, is it right to be in the materials-related business? Or is it most profitable to be there? Or how will your business have to change if you're really faced with much more information and data content than you are with, how do I get some diprosium or something? We all know that platforms are on the rise. Here's just one of the ones that discussed a great deal. But that vehicle there probably has a driver. And you know what I'm going to next. Uber already 
experimenting with driverless taxis, autonomous vehicles. And we don't know where things are headed either, but these are just a, a pattern from, this is from McKinsey, of the sorts of disruptive technologies they see going on. And a characteristic of many of these things is their impact on employment. Some can be positive, for sure. But many more could be negative. Here's a famous report. You only have to look at the slope. It's the chances that robots will take your jobs in the next 20 years. So I'd immediately move to being a clergyman. I'd be a priest. Because it looks like a priest or a dentist is your new direction. Uh, that, that you'll stay in that job. Uh, that one's likely. But if you're a technical writer or a retail salesperson, watch out. Now that is even pretty conservative. Stuff I've been reading lately says it'll be more than that. And uh, it's worth reading this if, 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 you, if you can. What it also brings, you see, is a fragmentation of the, the, the working economy or the, you know, the labor economy, the labor market. It doesn't create lots of big new full-time jobs. It creates many more fragmented gig economy, they call it. You know, you show up and do something. Perhaps for me it will be, yeah, Ken, he's quite good on that story. Employ him for two hours, we'll record him, and then turn him into something animated so we can change the words around he gets wrong, and we'll never have to see him again. So I'm wondering, and this one is, it's not necessarily something that most people look forward to. You can see that with the cartoon there. Isn't it exciting? Well, if you're in that mindset, it is. But if we've been suffering lately in politics from a lot of, or large groups of people being uncertain about the future, I don't think this encourages them about the digital revolution. But there's also this problem. When you're getting, this is um, overall growth for different countries. Japan has done particularly badly in the last 25 years. It's sort of stagnated. But growth overall is not exactly vibrant at the moment, with the exception of a couple of uh, Asian countries. If we cannot offer the, offer the population a means of participating in the economy, we're in for really difficult times, as most people know. But this also brings out, quite sadly, the return of the possibility that many businesses will think, well, I've got to get into being a monopoly controller of a platform because the economy is not growing that much, therefore I've got to increase the share that I get. And there is quite a lot of discussion about platforms being network monopolies. Uh, some people accuse Airbnb or um, Booking.com or TaskRabbit or Uber as being small, small, smallish examples of network capitalism, where they're trying to extract more monopoly profit because they know the pie isn't growing, and if they dominate the market, they can control those flows of revenue. So it might be very resource efficient. You might have very much many fewer cars doing more work. But the, the old question in Latin was qui bono? Who benefits from this? And for us, in a way, I mean, I say us because I'm interested in productive economy as much as you are. I want customers. You know, if I was role playing that. I want people to buy my services, buy my products, buy my materials. Where is that going to come from? So, that was a quick run through of, and I'd like to reiterate a couple of things about how perhaps we're seeing the circular economy as, yes, about materials. Yes, that's the lens we use. But in a way, the questions might be bigger. So, there is the sandwich, I call it. First of all, there is the systems thinking. We now understand the world because of digital. We can see nonlinear systems, feedback-rich systems, much more clearly, and it looks like an interesting way of working. So this would be a recognition that perhaps economics has to reflect that too. Then there's the business end of it. Now, many people do the circular economy just on this bit with things like cradle-to-cradle -cradle and product service systems and, and all the rest of it. But that's a bit like just having the middle from your sandwich. It's like saying, oh, the rest will, well, I don't want to know about how we think about things. I just want to get my job done, because that's what I'm in business to do. <laughs> There's also the important thing here, of course, enabling conditions. 
to make a system work that's full of feedback, what are the what are, what's the role of governance in there? What's the role of IT? Because, as we've seen just in a very brief excursion, you could revolutionize the labor market, and most people go, I hate this, because I'm just now fighting to be in that small elite that gets a full-time job with a career prospect, and the other prospect is being in the precariat, as Guy Standing calls it, those group of people where they've not got more than a few months' contracts or jobs till the end of next week. And as we've seen, people don't like that. And so our nice technical future where we'd be resource conserving, resource efficient, there may be problems on the social and economic side. So this is a nice butterfly full of feedback and opportunity, which I'm, I'm sure we're going to grab. I'm pretty sure it's coming more and more of this. But we've also got to remember, this is a very old diagram, that the economy is about like a cake. We can't just eat the icing. The icing on the top of the cake is just the private sector because it's supported quite literally by all those other sectors. And it is a bit like the analogy between uh, forests and trees. You feed the forest to feed the tree. The, the tree doesn't feed itself. And so the idea that all of this has to work pretty much as a whole before you can have the sorts of businesses that we want. Now, our logo there is that representation of the environment, social, and economic spheres interacting, their nested system. We accept that. And if you wanted just a, a quick summary of the direction that, that we are seeing the, the opportunities going in, it is from a more limited worldview, which is mechanical and linear, to a more sophisticated ecological or nonlinear worldview which is heading towards a restorative and regenerative economy, not doing just less harm. It's about doing good things. And um, I hope you can spot where I think I am in this, uh, in this picture. Right? I'm wearing something vaguely circular. Anyway, um, I've kept it short because I'd, I'd enjoy a few questions if it's allowed. I don't know, moderator, if that's allowed. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. <laughs>